This is Berkeley Talks, a Berkeley News podcast from the Office of Communications and Public Affairs that features lectures and conversations at UC Berkeley. You can follow Berkeley Talks wherever you listen to your podcasts. New episodes come out every other Friday. Also, we have another podcast, Berkeley Voices, that shares stories of people at UC Berkeley and the work that they do on and off campus. Welcome to LNS One. Today, we're talking about what is understanding, and I'm joined here by three faculty, and I'd like them to start off by introducing themselves. Hi, I'm Erlen Garcia. I'm an associate professor in molecular and cell biology and in physics, and I've been here since 2015. I work on physical biology or biophysics uh, with particular focus on how cells make decisions mm. in how you go from a single cell to an animal, for example. Um, and uh, an undergrad course I teach is MCB 137L, which is a lab course on physical biology. It's a dry lab course where we do lots of theoretical modeling, lots of simulations, coding. Um, so it's quite a fun class. Uh, my name is Christian Pais. I'm an associate professor in ethnic studies. I, I'm a historian by training. Uh, and so I do work on the 20th century farm labor uh, movement history in California. Uh, I teach classes in U.S. history for the most part. I teach uh, uh, ethnic studies uh, 10AC, which is for the first year students. Probably they'll be taking an American cultures class. <laughs> and that class is a, it's a history class on race and ethnicity in the U.S. West. And so it kind of covers a big, big range of, of classes. So a big range of uh, years. Hi, I'm Ariane Eason. I'm a faculty member in the psychology department. Um, I am a social, cultural, and developmental psychologist. Mm -hmm. And so what that really means is I study kind of what exists in our cultural world that promotes prejudice and bias, and then how can we systematically make changes to make a more equitable outcome for people um, of lots of different groups. Uh, inside my class, I teach Psych 163, which is the development of prejudice and bias. Mm -hmm. Our question today is, what is understanding? And this word understanding, we were chatting a little bit before this video started, uh, can mean so many different things, not just disciplinarily, but also grammatically. And so I wonder if each of you could um, maybe say a little bit from the point of view of your field and the kinds of research questions and methods that you have in your practice, what understanding means to you. You could also think about it, what it means in your classrooms. I mean, I guess I think, I guess maybe I'll go first. <laughs> um, so I think understanding is a really big, like that's a big question and a big topic that we can approach from a lot of different ways. Um, when I think about it through the lens of being a psychologist, I really think about understanding as a demonstration of, say, knowledge that we have about the world. Mm -hmm. um, but that knowledge doesn't necessarily have to be through what we say. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be explicit, but it's really about shaping the way that we engage with the world around us and with those around us and being very flexible. Um, mm -hmm. So I think a lot of times if we were thinking about the college context and what is understanding, it mm -hmm. might, you know, people's first reaction might be, I'm able to give an answer. Um, but that's not really understanding. Mm -hmm. It's really about being able to apply it to different contexts that you may not have seen before. Um, and I think kind of wrapped up in that for me is a recognition of, what you don't know, yeah. like, um, you know, to really understand also means to recognize what you don't understand um, and where the limits of your knowledge are. Mm -hmm. Ariane, I'm really curious, in your answer, you talked about the demonstration or application of knowledge, and you also talked about how it's flexible, like it can be applied to different situations. And I wondered, um, how that's connected to prejudice, because prejudice also seems like a way of understanding the world and maybe can be applied flexibly. Is, is prejudice flexible or inflexible? I think traditionally people have thought of prejudice as being a relatively inflexible um, kind of cognitive bias maybe and effective bias mm -hmm. um, in the sense that, you know, you kind of see someone who's from a particular social group mm -hmm. and you say, this is what they're like, mm -hmm. um, or you have this immediate feeling and reaction to them. Um, that's kind of without the broader contextual or idiosyncratic aspects of who that person is. Mm -hmm. um, and so in some ways, I think, uh, 
if I'm being very bold, I would say that prejudice is a lack of understanding of those around us at mm -hmm. kind of a really deep level. Um, yeah. Yeah, I like the the two words like context. I thought that was very interesting, and it's just having the tools to be able to assess the context. But also, I like the other aspect that you mentioned, which is also being humble enough to know what you don't know and to know that you don't know what people are thinking and to be, I mean, I, I would add also like the, the generosity that goes with that, right? Not assuming that, uh, that you know, again, what people are thinking, but mm -hmm. trying to, under, trying to, yeah, maybe understanding the way I'm seeing your definition is like being able to put yourself in other people's shoes mm -hmm. and try to, you know, be, be able to empathize. Yeah. Yeah, like perspective taking. Too. Yeah, something yeah. like that. I like that. Yeah, yeah. it's very interesting. Hmm. I mean, I think it also manifests outside of our interactions with other people, but also mm -hmm. in how we approach research. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are limits to like, how do we make sense of the world around us? Um, mm -hmm. Like, what are the contextual mechanisms that might exist in shaping, you know, I don't know, whether a cell goes from one cell to a multi-system mm -hmm. organism or... Um, even shaping, like, how do I know what the answer is um, mm -hmm. to a scientific question that I put out there? Mm -hmm. I, I'm really struck. I mean, because both of you are coming out of much more scientifically minded fields, <laughs> right? Or, I mean, or like self defined as, as science, and history is mm -hmm. quite averse to itself as a scientific <laughs> uh, field. So when the question was, brought up like what is understanding i thought i don't i, I don't know <laughs> like i don't i don't understand understanding in some ways i and i thought oh god i'm a professor like what is going on i don't know what understanding is no one's gonna take my classes now you know? so um you know and but, but part of it was that historians are so um i in, in many ways understanding feels layered uh it's like mm -hmm. a never so mm -hmm. we're, it's a never-ending process uh oftentimes there is an, uh, an, a, an attempt to engage uh, whatever argument you're being presented about the world in the past, usually. Um, it's an attempt to uh, identify the complexities of whatever st structure of that argument, right? Like the evidence that they're providing, the material that they're providing. Um, and that's important. But history is about humans, and it's mm -hmm. about people, and it's about the world, and it's about being alive or not being alive, and it's about some weighty things like prejudice. Uh, it can be about um, parents, people who are parents or people who are workers. And that kind of understanding really requires a, a tremendous um, insistence on ambiguity, right? And this, this, um, this comfort that you're taking care of business to know what you know, and yet at the same time, uh, this kind of generous, um, humble attempt to name the world as it appears to be at the moment. And then and, and with the idea that maybe you'll grow, right? And maybe you'll you'll become a little bigger, a little fuller, a little bit more flexible, more nimble, with, with what seems to be a contradiction of having something stable, like I know this, in addition to it's hard for me to imagine, for instance, in my case, farm workers who are working for a tiny amount of money and yet having to do with so many other facets of their life. So for an 18-year-old, usually here, uh, that might be hard to imagine. For some, <laughs> it might not be, right? But, but that, that kind of understanding, um, I'm not sure how to name it, but, but it feels kind of like this uh, ambiguity is a word that I keep coming up, yeah. W without going into the world of we don't know anything, which is sometimes could be an issue, and that, that's, yeah. to me, a, a troubling uh, thing to go into, so. But in some sense, it is connecting to this sort of empathy that we were discussing, sure. right? Like, yeah, given the context. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Empathy and also, like, um, rigor, right? Yeah. Um, and in, uh, uh, insistent and consistent uh, attempt to not lie. Uh, to, mm -hmm. me, that's, to begin with, not lying, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, to me, prejudice. Prejudice yeah. is lying. You <laughs> lie to the world and you lie to yourself that you don't see the world, right? Mm. Like that's, mm. that's the, but as an academic and as a, as a thinker and as a citizen, as a person in this world, the idea is that I'm here and I'll try to name the world as much as I can. Mm. And I'll try to hear the world as much as I can. And in that process, maybe 
I'll understand something. Um, <laughs> that's that's kind of like a dance. It's almost like a you know like an embodied. And we were talking about yeah. it's not just what you say; it's how you kind of kind of how you are. Maybe after all mm. the things you learn or don't learn. Yeah. Hmm. That'll get you an A to the students. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Though. Yeah, I'll get you. Just tell the professor. I'm embodying my understanding, <laughs> professor. <laughs> So I, I, and that's interesting. I guess my prejudice was with yeah. thinking about history yeah. that there was such a thing as a ultimate understanding or like, okay, you wrote the book on the subject and that's, oh, that that's there is such a thing as ultimate yeah. understanding. So that's... For sure. I so think, e even for like, in, like I don't know, the, like the, yeah. no matter what aspect of history you're saying that it's always being reworked? Oh, entirely. It's hard to imagine in many ways the full complexity of a society in any year. In any year. Right? It's like it's hard for us to imagine the complexity of no. our society right now. No. And we're, you know, we're all, we're in it, we're, yeah. we're in it and we're studiers of it, yeah. right? All four of us. Yeah. And to do that in another time period is, is very difficult. And, and the, the, it's not so much that history is being reworked, it's that we are reworking ourselves mm -hmm. in how we, how we engage with others. Mm -hmm. And, and that changes. So I'll give you an example. So I write, I write on farm workers uh, in a small little valley where I grew up. My, my family were farm workers and the, the people who I grew up were farm workers. Mm -hmm. And much of my politics is kind of rooted in labor and people working and thinking. And, and so I write this very long book, I think, or at least my family thinks it's very long. You know, they're like, they're like we have to read the whole thing. You know, so, so I write this long book and it's, it's all about what it means to be a body, a biology mm -hmm. in the world under the clear sun in the environment, picking fruit of usually mm. in this case are fruits and vegetables. And I'm doing this from 2010 to about 2016. That's when I'm doing my dissertation. Mm -hmm. And I'm embarrassed to say that I didn't even mention the environment mm. very or very little. Right. And, and, and in many ways is that my own consciousness was still kind of rooted in the 1990s. So like in many ways, mm -hmm. thinking about like fighting for a freedom that we're going to attain a future that's uh, mm -hmm. uh, really promising. And as I started to read more about um, the changes in climate change and the role that humans have been mm -hmm. playing on the environment in much more detail, it, it, that has changed the way that I even um, think about my my work, right? Like all this time, I could have been thinking about the environment too. All this time, I could have been writing about this interplay. Yeah. And I think historians are, for us, understanding is never an, an limit. It's more of a, a proposition, mm. right? And, 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 it's, and, it's a, and it's an invitation. Yeah. This is how I see, and what do you see? Because mm. we begin from the premise that we can see everything, mm. right? This, yeah, and yeah. so, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I guess I had the, the, the prejudice of like the facts, but you're saying it's about the study of the human condition and that yeah. understanding just keeps evolving. And, um, and that the facts yeah, that you have may yeah. not be all the facts. No, no, no. <laughs> and that, exactly. that we no, not no, no. even know where exactly. And that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that, how yeah. they yeah. interface with the, with the sure. society itself. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah, no, I hadn't thought in those terms. Yeah, so like that's interesting just because, you know, from the standpoint of, you know, my, my training is in physics. And, you know, there might be different gradations of what understanding means, but I think there's an overall agreement, more or less, that understanding ultimately, the, the, the measure of victory in, in physics is that of one of predictive understanding of phenomena, meaning mm -hmm. understanding something so well that you can predict with precision mm -hmm. the outcome of experiments before you can even do the, ex the experiment. So the outcome of some, though, the fact that there's going to be a black hole before you can see the black mm -hmm. hole, the fact that you can predict that a new particle will arise from this massive, you know, like particle accelerator experiment before that you like, like you, you, it comes on for the math. Mm -hmm. And that to me is the, yeah, it's the, de definitely the sense of, of victory that I'm after when I'm mm -hmm. thinking about biology. And, and in biology, understanding tends to be a little bit less well-defined sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, so what I find myself when bridging the two, uh, the two fields is that I, I need to emphasize a lot what my definition of victory mm -hmm. looks like so that you put the philosophy apart and you get to work in, you know, this is where, where I'm, where I'm heading, uh, where I'm heading with the, with the sort of experiments and the sort of science mm -hmm. that we do. I mean, it definitely feels like our fields are on like a spectrum because mm -hmm. I feel like psychology sits somewhere in the middle of history <laughs> yeah. and physics slash biology on this. Um, 
And it's really interesting because it's been a lot of the conversations of our field. Like, is our goal to predict exactly what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. And do we think that that prediction is going to hold five years from now, mm -hmm. 10 years from now? And what is the role of, say, cultural spaces? Mm -hmm. You know, if we understand the fact that the world is always changing around us, mm -hmm. do we actually think that we've done a good job at specifying the conditions under which something will occur? And the answer is usually no, mm -hmm. um, because I think that's really the power of culture. We're steeped in it. It's mm -hmm. the air we breathe. But just like us breathing air, we don't even realize we're doing it. We don't even realize it's there. And so it's ever shifting, though. Like if I think about like the time before COVID, right? Mm -hmm. I, I lived through it, <laughs> you know, I, I worked through it, but it's a fundamentally different approach to academia. Mm -hmm. Like our academic discipline looked very different before then in the middle of it mm -hmm. now. Um, and so, you know, if you take that same experiment that you ran 10 years ago, mm -hmm. when people were in just a different space, would mm -hmm. you expect the same outcome? And that's really one of the bigger questions that our field has been really mm -hmm. grappling with. Mm -hmm. um, and it has led, I think, in some ways to a crisis in psychology of, do we actually understand the world around us mm -hmm. as well as we think we did um and it you know it's broader than just the idea of culture shifting dynamically over time but also is the culture that everyone inhabits the same so mm -hmm. is the life of black people similar mm -hmm. to the life of you know white people mm -hmm. latinx people native people in the united states and if we only ever say run studies mm -hmm. that have you know, populations of college students or populations mm -hmm. of uh, predominantly white people from the Western world, are we missing so much of how the world actually works and how we mm -hmm. understand the people in it? Um, and so that has been really, a, I think, a powerful guiding mm -hmm. space of our field of what does it mean to expand our understanding mm -hmm. of what it means to be human and engage? Um, yeah. That's fantastic. I, I do think we're very much in the spectrum. And, yeah. mm -hmm. and it seems that our fields are often shifting in that spectrum position because history was very, it claimed itself as a science for much of the 20th century. Like mm -hmm. um, historians of multiple political stripes were attempting to figure out what are the motors of history? What mm -hmm. are the things that across time explain mm -hmm. change? Right, like, how do we make sense of the chaos of the past? Like, it's not just all happening at the same time. The argument is that there must be some laws, some time, which is a very ahistorical argument. There must be some ahistorical propositions that explain history mm. in order to predict the future, right? Mm. In order to be able to say, how must we move? You know, th there's always the phrase of those who don't study history risk predicting it or something like that. Doomed, uh, doomed to repeat it. Well, I don't know. Even if you study history, you might be doomed mm -hmm. to repeat it. Like that's yeah. like because there's no predictive power in, in the past uh, for the future, or at least not enough in order to in that in the in the, the, the ways that maybe perhaps your both of your fields might be doing it. Um, and in history, because history has two major problems. On the one end it has uh, um, very little information about people in the past, right? So the the who whose whose documents are safeguarded mm -hmm. uh, or or made available uh, to scholars usually skew in mm -hmm. in a variety of ways mm -hmm. that usually reflect those in positions of power in those societies, right. and or reflect particular events. So. Um, you know, uh, if you have experiences or uh, histories of colonialism, a lot of those documents will be destroyed. A lot of the, the knowledges will be destroyed. And so how you can write this history will be in many ways a reflection of what is already not there. That's the one first problem. The second problem is that there's just way too much information. There's just like too much, right? Like think of all the texts that you send. Think mm -hmm. of all the, the bills that you, every single, I have, I, I am a hoarder. <laughs> like now I'm really like, oh, should I put this out? But like, <laughs> I, you know, and I have like, so I have like random mm -hmm. receipts that I just keep. And that, I, or I think it's because I'm a historian. It's like, and I, but who are, like, you're going to have to go through all those receipts if you're going to write my biography, like there's <laughs> something, right? And so that's what historians, you have so mm -hmm. many documents so many sources, so many hours to listen, so that you have to start picking. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. uh, what you're going to do and what you're not going to do and what, what resources. So you have too little and then you have too much. And the kind of like the contradiction, the, the contradiction holds because you make creative choices in the narrative arc, right? Of what seems rational, what seems understanding. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that's a, to, to historians went through a crisis in the 80s and the 90s about it's the linguistic underpinnings of mm-hmm. history that the languages that we use, the, the narrative structures that we use, the expectations that we have about how we tell the story are really much more reflective of the, the humanities than they are of the sciences. Mm-hmm. And, and I think historians have kind of um, have increasingly adopted that. It's Excellent. like a bitter pill, but we, you know, we're, we're like, okay, we can only say so much. Yeah. So you don't think you can get to some sort of predictive framework about societies? I mean, this is probably for both of you. Yeah. Like, well, what do you think? I mean, I, mean, I guess that's field. one of the dreams of yeah. many psychologists. Yeah. I think psychology, similarly, there's a group that leans towards, uh, they call it physics envy. Like, we want to yeah. be able to predict everything. Here are the universals of the world. Um, and then you have kind of the other side that would call itself more of a humanistic social science, Mm -hmm. um, which really takes into consideration like socio-historical and cultural context. Uh, That's Mm -hmm. the side I probably sit closest on. Um, But, you know, psychology is made up of like seven different disciplines that kind of really range on the expectation of how much, say, something like culture would matter. Although Mm -hmm. it matters in all the disciplines, you know, you definitely get more of discussions of, Um, culture mattering in something like social and personality psychology, in clinical psychology, uh, perhaps in developmental psychology, Mm -hmm. and a little bit less of discussions, although definitely still some people do have those discussions in um, disciplines like cognition and perception. Um, Mm -hmm. Even though we know that culture does matter, even at like a basic level Mm -hmm. of color perception, right? If you're in a culture where they label different shades of colors Mm -hmm. more specifically Mm -hmm. or broadly, you actually do perceive Mm -hmm. the boundaries very differently. So we know that um, culture matters, Mm -hmm. but sometimes it's a little harder to convince people of that. Um, I don't know if I think the goal of our discipline is to actually fully be predictive of like in the future because will we ever have the exact same conditions repeat themselves? And Mm -hmm. I think that is an open question that I'm not sure we'll ever have the answer to um, because I think expand like understanding expands, contracts, you look at it from a different kind of space. And something you said earlier really struck me um, about how we think about knowledge. Like one thing I've Mm -hmm. thought a lot about and in my work we talk a lot about is this concept of omission or these Mm -hmm. things that are rendered invisible Mm -hmm. in our social space. And I think as an experimentalist, it's really hard to study what doesn't exist in our world. Mm -hmm. Um, How do you tap into something that's not in people's minds Mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, figure out the outcome of what's Mm -hmm. not there. Um, But when we think about what knowledge is, it's both about what exists in the world, but Mm -hmm. also what's left out. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's really important, I think, to capture both of those pieces Mm -hmm. um, because they are a dynamic that really reinforces the status quo and reinforces uh, power structures. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I I feel like that's where the humanistic kind of Mm -hmm. social science Mm -hmm. aspect of the work that I do mm-hmm. and really think about kind of mm-hmm. comes out. Yeah. Um, I, this is a great question, like the predictive power, right? And where are our fields? Yeah, uh, yeah the, the reason I'm, I'm asking it because, you know, like trying to attack biology uh-huh. from the standpoint of the, the physical framework, mm-hmm. you do get a lot of resistance. There's mm-hmm. this whole view of vitalism mm-hmm. in some sense. That's basically where, where you know the idea is that this, the the cell is such a complex mm-hmm. thing that it's you know impenetrable to the sort of approaches that mm-hmm. physics has, mm-hmm. right? Like you know, and you know the whole point of why organic molecules are called organic molecules is because people thought that they could only be made by cells by living things, and then mm-hmm. you know people showed that you can synthesize urea, for example, that was a big deal. So you know, in the history of of our understanding of biology, uh, this idea of vitalism has been moved. Mm-hmm. You know, like, you know, like it gets in some sense, it's like, well, okay, but the whole cell, is, uh, you know, it's hard to mm-hmm. think of a predictive model of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, but, you know, in principle, um, 
I, there is no fundamental law that tells us that you cannot predict the, uh, the, uh, the, the behavior of a cell. It might be more using more statistical approaches instead mm -hmm. of deterministic approaches because they're mm -hmm. embedded in a thermal background where there's noise. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, so, you know, that's what I'm saying. You know, there is a little bit of this tension, though in my case, I'm, I guess I'm betting kind of my career on the fact that you can, you can actually yeah. Uh, yeah. deploy this sort of predictive understanding in the context of, of living systems. But the other, the other place where I think there's a, there could be an interesting connection yeah. with understanding, especially since you're saying, okay, before, in the past, we don't have that much data, but now like we have too much data, uh -huh. right? You know, in, in biology and to some degree in physics, there's, you know, with all these uh, new machine learning approaches, there's also this, this uh, um, opportunity to gain predictive power, right? Mm -hmm. Though many times devoid of any understanding. Yeah. Right, uh, and so, but I don't know how that if that that sort of thing ca is also uh, interesting in the context of sure. the type of stuff you guys do. Wait, can you say more about that? Well, well I mean, like, how know. does that show up in your research, for example? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, the classic example I tell is been known in my research, which is like you know, Google can predict traffic, but it doesn't understand traffic, mm. right? Like, you, like you know, you can predict outcomes, but you know, uh, and maybe that's enough. Like it, again, it depends on your own definition of victory, right? Yeah. But my definition of victory is one of understanding what I predict. And also fundamentally, I mean, the, you know, this is something that comes up a lot in my circle of friends. Is like, I think as scientists, ultimately, we want to be able to tell simple stories, mm -hmm. right? And, and telling somebody, well, I figured this out because I train a model with like, you know, 50 convolutional layers and 50 million parameters. It doesn't sound like something I can explain to my grandma. Mm -hmm. Right, so so there's that tension, but again, maybe maybe also we need to adjust what we mean by understanding. So in the in the example you're giving, Google can predict traffic patterns, but it has no understanding of it. It sounds like for you, it's being able to explain, and that's also what you're saying it's, about the machine it, learning that you can't really explain. Maybe it's like a black box. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like a black box. Though people are doing here and in other places, they're trying to be very smart about how to reverse engineer the black box to get understanding yes. of why things work when you use them in the context of a machine learning model. Yes, and that for you is victory. If I can, again, predictive understanding to me, that's my own definition of victory. Yes. I, wanna, I wanna be able to explain it in a simple way, with like biological phenomena, you know, why, again, why does a cell decide to be part of the head or part of the tail? Based on the DNA sequence, based on the inputs of signals that come from the environment, for example. I, I want to make an observation about the ways that each of you have been talking about understanding and maybe trying to, um, I don't want to get too abstract because we've been talking at a level of abstraction, I think, so I'd like to get more grounded. But I do have this observation to make, which is that I think in the ways that some of you have been talking about understanding, it's about, like I think about this term embodied understanding, it's about like our understanding, like my understanding of the world. and you know, coming to a better understanding of something. But then some of you also talked about a collective understanding, like an understanding mm -hmm. that a field understands or that we understand as humans at this point in our evolution and our society. And so maybe this is a question more for Ariane because your, your research is so much about mm -hmm. individual and collective, but I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that interplay of Maybe we could think about it more in terms of a field of research or, you know, what we do at a research university in terms of advancing individual and collective understandings. Yeah, I mean, I think that's such a mm -hmm. big and important question. Um, you know, when I really think about our role as individuals in a larger collective, I'm often drawn to this idea that we can't be a self by ourselves, mm -hmm. um, that you're always kind of in community and in connection with others. And so your understanding or your sense of self is fundamentally shaped by those mm -hmm. who are around you. Um, and so, you know, I don't think it's an accident probably how we ended up in our life courses, like mm -hmm. sorting into our different fields, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we saw something about the way that our fields approach the work and we mm -hmm. said, mm, that's, that fits with something about mm -hmm. how I see the world. Mm -hmm. And then as we got in there, we were socialized mm -hmm. a bit more 
into our spaces and said, okay, well, yeah, like, let me delve deeper into the way that my field understands and thinks about these questions. And then, you know, I think as you get older and deeper, you can say, well, I'm going to push back on mm -hmm. the way that my field might, you know, kind of engage mm -hmm. um, and broaden yeah. the understandings that we bring yeah. um, in our disciplines and say, well, you know, it would it would help a little bit for psychologists to think about mm -hmm. these extra pieces or here are things that are missing. I'm going to, you know, occupy this space and bring the tools of my trade to this other kind of space that could be useful. Um, so then we're broadening by like us as individuals, we end up broadening our theories and how our like fields approach things. So I'll give one example. One of my lines of research is looking at um, the omission of contemporary representations of Native people mm -hmm. um, and the impacts that that has for promoting inequality and anti-Native bias. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you look kind of over our discipline, psychology is one of the disciplines that really in the world helps us understand what is prejudice, bias, and inequality. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I think one analysis that we've done is showing that there have been more than like 40,000 published papers wow. in peer-reviewed journals on prejudice, bias, mm -hmm. stereotyping. So we really are out here saying, this is what it is. <laughs> Here's the experience <laughs> and all these things. But if you really look into those papers, they're primarily about black and white people's experiences, mm -hmm. and less than a half a percent um, even mention Native people. Um, so just for context, Native people are about 2% of the U.S. population. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we think about that, mm -hmm. it's like, how are we defining what prejudice is, what the experience mm -hmm. is, if we're only looking at it through the view of one group's experiences? Mm -hmm. um, it's not saying that we shouldn't study those groups. As a black person, I absolutely think we should study <laughs> uh, um, anti-black bias, all of these things. But how does it render invisible other groups? Like, can we assume that the bias manifested towards black people mm -hmm. is the same as the bias manifested mm -hmm. towards Latinx people, towards native people, towards Asian people? And I think, you know, if you just take a cursory look at the world around us, you would say the answer is no. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there are similarities, mm -hmm. but there are also some unique things. And so being able to say, okay, like here are the unique experiences that exist, mm -hmm. help us better understand what a theory of bias might be. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think about that through the lens of what is individual experience and what are the role of us as individuals, um, saying like, this is something that deserves to be studied. This is yeah. something that needs to be talked about and understood um, more formally. And then taking that to the collective and saying, mm -hmm. now I'm putting this out there in the world. I'm making the invisible visible and uh you know kind of charging it for all of us who are in this space to then contend with if i want to make a theory of bias if i want to have a theory of prejudice now i have to incorporate this knowledge in there um, to become more precise um, to become uh more specified in what we mean and what okay. we actually want to say um, I don't know if that answered your question, but... I think so. I mean, I think I was just struck by this idea that we started with where you were talking about, um, you know, how we enrich, broaden, deepen our personal understanding of XYZ. And Christian, I think you were talking about this as well. And I was just thinking about how that moves then to a larger understanding that can be empirically tested or we, that where we can see progress in our understanding. I was thinking more about, you know, Anand, what you were saying about your field's understanding of understanding, which is that you can have, you can achieve an understanding. You can get to a state where the field does have an accepted understanding of this phenomenon, um, a certain law or principle, to use a, a term that you used earlier, Christian. And when I think about the that interplay of like the collective understanding as you know individual researchers enter into a field, sometimes coming from these interdisciplinary methods, like what you were saying about bringing what you've um, learned from your physics training to a molecular biology field, like mm -hmm. the, and then thinking about what you were saying about you know this field as it's developed over time has certain omissions in the kinds of participants that it's had, the kinds of research questions that it's asked and how to bring that 
fuller understanding seems to also come from both that collective and that individual intervention. Um, just trying to think about, you know, some of the threads that sure. we've discussed so far. Well, like I, I just wanted to connect to that because yeah. we talked about the assumptions mm -hmm. that one needs mm -hmm. to make. We talked about the layered understanding, mm -hmm. but also I think one thing that is sometimes a, a, a challenge, mm -hmm. at least my field, is what level of course graining are you after? You know, like, you know, like the understanding can be at different, you mentioned yeah. it at different levels, but, you know, like as a classic example, it's like, I don't know where all the, I don't need to know where all the atoms are to build a bridge, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I don't need to know where each molecule is yeah. in here, what yeah. speed it's going at, mm -hmm. in order to be able to make statements about pressure and temperature. Uh -huh. So, you know, that's, yeah. there is, a, you know, in some sense saying, well, there are all these things that I'm willing to throw away Mm -hmm. that I don't need to account for in my theory. And then, but then I can test whether I was right in throwing those away by seeing how much predictive power I have. Mm -hmm. So I guess the two things that I, 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 I'm yeah. finding that are the things that maybe connect in some way though, you know, the, the, how you deliver on them and whether you can actually, you know, you can actually test that predictive understanding whether it was, you were okay in getting rid of those assumptions or not. Sure. It's harder to test. Um, I guess what I wanted to say on, on, on that front is that you know, when I when I talk about understanding, also I think there's a level of, of nuance in terms of what level of course screening you want. And that might also be philosophical to some degree, mm -hmm. right? You know, mm -hmm. like, do I need to account for this? Do I need to know what that 1% deviation is mm -hmm. or not? Um, so I'm curious whether that that plays a role, you know, and how that plays a role in, in the, the type of understanding that you guys seek. Yeah, that's a great, I, there's so many things, right? Like, thinking earlier the comments on the collective and now here the layering. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I, I don't know. I you know, I think about history. I mean there so history has a ton of facts, right? So there's not like anyone can understand whatever they understand. So like there's a ton of facts and there are things that just don't make sense once you look at the data that we have available mm. to us. So people don't get to have their own history or their own understanding. They get to wrestle with whatever it is that we have. And the understanding is really the wrestling. It's like you just have mm. to work hard. Like mm. uh, it's not about your A paper, it's about your A semester. It's about like reading books, debating books, figuring out the, the weaknesses of those books, thinking about the ways that you might be able to bring into not only your own experiences, which, which are fundamental to, to learning, um, but also your, your, your tendencies and your, um, mm. and your curiosity and, mm. and, and the surprises, because that 1% deviation suddenly could become the whole basis Absolutely. of a new field, right? And you're Absolutely. like, oh my God, you know, who knew? You know, like, yeah. no one, you know, until mm -hmm. this person came in. Um, so this, in the, the role of the individual person, in, especially the individual undergraduate in the field is one of just like bounty, I would hope. Like the rigor of working hard, but like you're at a buffet at the same time and you're eating everything, right? <laughs> and you just want to figure out, okay, if I mix this and I mix this, what happens if I mix this? Like that, that kind of energy. So that, to me, and that, that, that ideally could flow into a, a a, a really significant and maybe even potentially profound realization that benefits all of us as we read your work and as we consider the ways that you are seeing the world uh, and that we may not have and that we don't need to just yet. That This is your role, right? Like we learn from you as teachers. Um, uh, you know, history, so I'm a, a you know I'm a historian, but I'm also an oral historian. And so for me, mm. the collective is always principal. It's like mm. I, I collect. I did about 200 hours of oral histories with mm. people in their 70s and 80s, and there was just nothing I could have learned without those hours, mm. right? And so for me, it's like what I write is really just more of an echo of what people have said. It's like a massive funnel that kind of allows me to say. I think this is what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I For, think yeah. this is how they see it. I mm -hmm. think this is what it, they experience. And let me show you all the infrastructure that allows you to decide whether or not you think I'm right. Yeah. Right? Like that, 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 I'll show you, you know, I'll show you my, my data, I guess, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that, and that, so for me, so I entered history because I wanted predictive power. I, you mm. know, I grew up really poor. I grew up, uh, really working class families and I wanted to figure out a way to, 
uh, fight back, right? To 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 equalize people, to to have food, to have health insurance, to have housing, all of that. And I wanted to know how people fought back in the past, mm-hmm. and what were the benefits of that, and what were the predictive powers of that. Yeah. And so, and and that is in many ways, I think, a a high aspiration for history. How do we make mm-hmm. our world more democratic? Um, you know, more human, even if that's a complicated word. Like, how do we make ourselves uh, the very thing that we say that we are, right? Which is that we're we're civilized or that we're evolved or something like that. Um, and um, but I don't I don't know if history offers that. It, it, there's just so many different mm. variables at play. You know, um, uh, th- there's a- any way of that kind of level of understanding mm-hmm. would put us outside of history. Mm-hmm. That would it would put us in a present that just never changes. That that we once we know the 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 rules of movement and, and the factors, then we will just know what's going to happen in the future, and we will know what happened in the past. Like there's just it just be a present linearity that just doesn't seem to it. it at least in my experience, hasn't been available to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything is historical. Everything is ambiguous. And and the question is not so much, can we predict the future? Like um, the UFW, the United Farm Worker Movement, which is what I work on, they had this big phrase that said, si se puede, yes, we no. can, si se puede. Si. And that language was has been interpreted as, we will have freedom. We will do this. We, we will get there. Mm-hmm. As opposed to simply, yes, we can. Mm-hmm. So the can is different from the will. Yeah. And 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 that is the so history focuses on the can, we study mm-hmm. the past so that we know what's available to us, yeah. right? The will is not available to us, mm-hmm. unfortunately or fortunately, you know. Mm-hmm. That's a, that is a and the historian, the student then engages with the full humanity, of the person, in the past, and as they kind of get through these layers of understanding, ideally, they're able to see as much as they can these people on their terms. And they're able to see themselves newly in their terms with the terms of a potentially bigger world than just themselves. That's incredibly powerful. <laughs> that, 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 yeah. That can. I, I yeah. really love that. Yeah. And, I, you know, as you were speaking, it also had me in a space of the different layers of understanding and how do we know which layers to throw out and which yeah. layers we can uh, or should for any given topic. And, you know, one of the things that I think really strikes me is in psychology, I don't know if we're necessarily on like, this is the understanding, Mm -hmm. but when thinking about how to make sense of other people's minds, uh, we recognize that there is this, the different ways that people understand the same event has different consequences. Mm -hmm. And I think that like through that lens, it's Mm -hmm. a recognition of there's different people come to different thoughts about the same situation, but those different ways of making sense have consequences that are unique. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I think about that for what the goal of going to college is and the college Mm -hmm. students, like I would say that it's about expanding your toolbox so that you can see the different levels, so that you can take in what are different forms of understanding that people have. um, So that way you can interact kind of a across a broad group of people um, and experiences and things along those lines. But I also caution through the lens of, you know, understanding inequity um, Mm -hmm. that if we only focus at one level, then we have this danger of reinstantiating and essentializing people and experiences. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that we take this kind of multifaceted um, multiple layered understanding of events um, Mm -hmm. and that like, you may not have it now because you're an 18 year old, I, like or you know, or a transfer student, or any of these things. Mm-hmm. Like you might not have it, and that's okay. But part of coming to this space is saying, what happens if I take classes across different yeah. disciplines exactly. to get those exactly. different layers and those mm-hmm. different approaches? What happens when I meet new people mm-hmm. um, to get a sense of where their backgrounds are, how they view the world, um, and that's where you really kind of yeah. come with those layers that are starting to develop that's where you come with some of that humility of Mm -hmm. you know there are ways of engaging in the world that i don't know yet or that i don't understand and i can gain that through my experiences here in the classroom and not in the classroom yeah (laughs) this is a great conversation i'm really i already learned so much i know i'm like can i sit in you guys' class (laughs) (laughs) Well, I yeah. wanted to come back to, as a way of wrapping up today's conversation, something, Ariane, that you 
are sort of, I think, getting at with your latest comment, but something earlier in the conversation that you said where you were uh, sort of remarking on the way that for each of our panelists today, there's something about the disciplines that they have found themselves in that attracted them to it. I'm thinking now about the cell decision, right? Like there's a cluster of things here that seems to be speaking over. Maybe it's over by the tail over here. So I wonder, and Christian, you've, you've yeah. spoken so beautifully about how you came to the research that you were doing and how it's so deeply rooted in, if I may um, put in my own words, something about the way that history gives us a sense of possibility mm -hmm that there's not these foreclosed, predetermined outcomes like the predictive power. If you are born into this zip code, this set of circumstances, this is how your life is gonna turn out. And I think for history, for you, like mm -hmm. history gives you those, um, those stories and frameworks to understand, okay, it doesn't always have to be this way. Here are these moments in history where a collective changed something. And that, I think for you, is what is so powerful about this discipline and the research that you've taken up. And I wanted to give um, Ernan and Ariane a little bit of time to share a little, maybe for our students, like what mm -hmm. do you think drew you to the disciplines and research questions mm -hmm. that have animated your work? Mm -hmm. Well, I think for me, it's basically a sense of wonder for the natural world. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think the question of I wonder is the, the main driver force and you know that's why I'm, though there is obviously applications in you know and foreseen and unforeseen applications in the sort of basic science we do i'm a big proponent of of basic science and just figuring things out for the sake of figuring th things out and mm -hmm. uh, for also the, the self-growth of like just knowing more in life you know i mean i think you know, something that comes out a lot at home in the, the sort of conversations, you know, what is what is a life worth living? Mm. And, you know, there's many definitions of that, you know, and, you know, some of it is defined by the interpersonal relationships, how we relate to mm. the people around us. But one of them is also that I define myself for myself is the, about personal growth in the sense of mm -hmm. understanding the world better, you know, both from the social aspect, but also from, you know, how how does the world work in, in general? And so, and I think that's the way I went into the sort of science that I do because I find this, the, the math and physics framework of understanding the natural world very appealing. But, you know, once again, because of this the definition of predictive understanding where that makes it, that makes me feel like satisfied in, in my, in, in, in that pursuit of, of uh, trying to figure out how things work. Mm, making a contribution. Yeah, I mean, there is an element of making a contribution, but it's, this is also, in some sense, a completely selfish endeavor. Mm -hmm. It's just fun, mm -hmm. and yeah. it's, I don't know, it's just fun to figure things out. Mm -hmm. And I think we do contribute by even passing along that excitement to the students. And Ariane, how about for you? Oh, I, you know, I went to college and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, you know, my family was totally like doctor, lawyer, teacher. <laughs> um, I was like, okay, cool, cool. Um, and I, I definitely, I was not sure. Um, and I ended up working in a psychology lab by complete accident. Um, I was like, I realized that like my friends had jobs mm -hmm. and they were like, Ari, you too could apply for a job that feels more useful than ring, like opening the door for people. And I was yeah. like, oh, yes. <laughs> um, and I had no idea what a lab or research lab was, but I was like, I can play with children. Like yeah. I can entertain children for time. Mm -hmm. And I ended up being able to work in a psych lab and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, at that same time, there was a class and it was called Social Psychology of the Oppressed. And I was like, this sounds like exactly what I want to take. And I was like, please. Um, and it was just a space where I felt like I really got to marry my interest in like people watching and figuring out people and why they do what they do with also kind of understanding and getting a sense of uh, what inequality looked like and how to advocate for inequality. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time like in the Black Student Alliance. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of felt like I could blend my mm -hmm. like 
outside of academic mm -hmm. pursuits with my like intellectual curiosity. And mm -hmm. I ended up falling in love. I did a senior thesis and I, my professor was like, I think you would like research. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> I was like, people like me don't do that. Sorry. Um, and then I, I, you know, then I went to grad school. And so I really think that some of it was college as an opportunity to try something that I had no idea what existed before. And it was a space where I would have never said like, oh, I'd like to be a professor yeah. in my life. Mm -hmm. It was that I like doing a project. And mm -hmm. for some reason, I kept showing up to do this project and to run this study. And I was like, I think if I can do this now and I still mm -hmm. like it and I keep showing up, I'm probably going to keep showing up. And that's <laughs> that's really what happened. And yeah. I, it was really a space that I think got to blend so much of my life experience growing up. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I started studying uh, intergroup relations mm -hmm. and uh, black-white segregation. I still study mm -hmm. that as well. Um, but in part because I grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, but went to a school that was mandated to be 70% ethnic, 30% white. Mm -hmm. And so kind of it was a great experience as a like middle school and high school, but it also, you could still see self-segregation. You could still see kind of a two school phenomena break mm -hmm. out. And it was like, why, despite the diversity that we have, mm -hmm. did we still sort across group lines? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I got to think about those questions mm -hmm. for so long and then actually realize that people, people study them <laughs> um, and can, can use that knowledge to create better outcomes. And so that was really what drew me to the field. Like I think psychology has so much potential for mm -hmm. impacting the world in positive ways. Mm -hmm. um, and this was one of the dimensions that kind of fit with my spirit yeah. <laughs> um, that I didn't know about before until college that people did. Mm -hmm. I think what you just said also is very relevant in, in the context of this class in terms of, you know, like so many of us going to college saying, well, I'm going to do this or that, but you know, how special it is to be in an environment that is where you can actually explore things mm -hmm. and how important it is to yeah. engage in the adventure of learning, mm -hmm. uh, leveraging all the opportunities there are mm -hmm. to you know, just explore what sort of things one could do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's very important, especially, again, thinking of letters and sciences, like the, the breadth and the, you know, the breadth of opportunities out mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Christian, I wanted to give you a chance to yeah. expand on what you shared earlier in response sure. to this question. Um, so I, I, didn't, I didn't think I was going to be an academic. I, I, mm. I mean, I, I was super nerdy as a kid, <laughs> and, um, but I... I, I thought that going back to school and being an academic was kind of removing myself from the good fight, right? From mm. changing laws, mm. um, um, you know, I don't know, making reforms, contributing in that way. And it's, and I, I think it's understandable. And I think a lot of our students feel that pressure of, of being here, of reading books, of being nerdy, of being excited, but at the same time, uh, worrying about their parents paying rent, worrying about their parents buying food, and wondering, like, what's the point of me being mm. here um, if if my family is struggling or if people I love are struggling or if the world is struggling, right? Like, you see the world. And so, uh, and I remember once being a, a, an undergrad and taking a seminar class, super wonderful class, reading really beautiful, like, literature, and excited and loving the discussion and coming home or leaving the class and thinking that my mother had made $21 in those three hours because the minimum wage was $7 at that <laughs> point, right? So so that contradiction was really heavy uh, as an undergrad and it was really heavy when I was really young. Uh, so I became a teacher. That was my sense of contributing. I was mm -hmm. a high school teacher, a history teacher. And so for the students who who are here, I was the AP US history teacher. So I'm guessing many of them might have taken the, that class and that kind of, ah, like, and, and it was there that I realized um, that I had been wrong, right? That there are many different ways to contribute because we were doing really wonderful work as teachers, but the, the environmental engineers who were figuring out how to distribute water in a desert were doing really important work. And the folks who were doing uh, housing development and the, 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 they're not figuring out where the atoms are, but they know exactly what kind of wood to use. And all of those were contributions, including the contribution of uh, any poets and musicians and uh, physicists, psychologists. And for me, that gave me an opportunity to then pursue school a further school as a way to then tell the story to my home that mm -hmm. already existed there, but that it was not understood, that it was not visible. And so that, so to me, um, 
So I returned a little. So for me, it wasn't a, it, it was undergrad and then I didn't think I was going to return. And then it was through my experiences as a teacher and with my high school students that kind of pushed me to go back to school. And, it, and that has shaped in many ways the ways that I do history still and the ways that I think of myself, you mm -hmm. know, doing history from now on. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. There are pathways, cool. right? So. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for our conversation today, and thank you for watching. You've been listening to Berkeley Talks, a Berkeley News podcast from the Office of Communications and Public Affairs that features lectures and conversations at UC Berkeley. Follow us wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can find all of our podcast episodes with transcripts and photos on Berkeley News at news.berkeley.edu slash podcasts. 